Let's turn over to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And I sense that some of those things I was saying were not just by me saying it's unction of the Spirit. I did not say, thus saith the Lord, but it was just as much a unction by the Spirit, more of a word of knowledge, because some of you are like, yeah, that's me, which means the Lord, through his word of knowledge, wanted me to encourage you along those lines. Amen. Amen. Some of you, I could call out some very specific things because I just happen to know. And let me just say this. Thank you, Lord. Because the Lord is trying to deal with his church often. Um, does the Lord know everything? Yes. Right. So why is it that saints get so impressed by a minister that doesn't know you, but by the Spirit of God can tell you about what's going on in your life, then give you the words you need to overcome it, and we would rather receive it from that person than someone that God's placed in your life, like your pastor who happens to know what's going on because you told them, but then told you the same word by the scripture that you need to overcome, but we want to get it from a stranger. Because you're not getting a more sure word of scripture of how to overcome from someone who just didn't happen to know your problem. That doesn't make it more spiritual. In fact, I would even submit to you this way. The reason why some of those gifts are actually in operation is because of the failure of people to actually be under their pastor. And it's God, again, trying to get your attention because why in the world are you way over there? Yeah, it's good preaching. It's not popular, but I'm not here for a popularity contest. I'm just here to do the word of the king. Amen. John the Baptist wasn't in a popularity contest. Neither was Jesus. Jesus said, y'all all go to the house. Right? Because at the end of the day, I'm just going to do the will of my father. Amen. And that's the best place of peace, just doing the will of the father. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15 says this, and now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So these two verses here, if you put them both up at the same time, would be really awesome. Is that... <clears throat> Jesus is literally communicating what the gospel is. Just in case we don't, because, you know, we got to go preach the gospel. Jesus tells us the gospel. Because it says Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. Verse 15 tells us what it is. Saying. What did he say? The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. That's the gospel. The good news is that the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, guess what that includes? Being born again. Because you can't see the kingdom unless you're born again. You can't enter the kingdom unless you're born again. But the good news is not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The good news is the kingdom of God. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is what was the required payment so that we could be forgiven of our treason and the debt associated with our life. Because again, God's ready to forgive man in Genesis chapter 3. No issue. When Adam eats the fruit and God comes into the garden and then he eventually speaks to the serpent, he said, I'll bring my seed through the woman. In essence, I want to forgive man, but I cannot give him forgiveness until the debt's paid. He can't enter into life until it's paid. That's why everyone prior to Jesus' death burial is in paradise. They're in the grave. They cannot go and be present with the Lord. Because 
The payment is not there. They're waiting on payment. Now, forgiveness obviously is in play for them to be in a separate place than those that were beyond the abyss. However, it does not give them access to God yet, or they cannot be present, in, be in his presence, be before him consistently or eternal until the payment comes. So Jesus is telling us the good news is the kingdom. It's the kingdom. My work, Jesus says, is to pay the price so you can have the kingdom back. So he says, listen, the time is fulfilled. In essence, I've come to make payment. So the good news in this particular dispensation we're in, uh, called the new covenant, is that when we die, we don't go to the grave. We get to be present before the Lord. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And so we'll go to heaven and be with him until he returns. And then we'll be with him when he returns. But it says the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. That is the gospel. Then he goes on and says this. Now, the gospel is the kingdom of God, but there's, a, there's something necessary for you to have the gospel. Two things are required. Say two things. Two things are required. Say two things. Two things are required. Say two things. Two things. The first thing is repent. And repent is not a religious word. It means change your thinking. So you repent and believe. Repent and believe in the, in what, what is the gospel? The kingdom of God. Amen. So the gospel is the kingdom of God of which Jesus is the king of the kingdom. That's why the Bible says all who call on the name of the Lord, because Lord is supreme in authority. It's not a religious word. It means Jesus is the king of the kingdom. And for you to get in the kingdom, then you must believe that the payment Jesus paid for your treason against the crown of the father was made and you're going to make him your supreme in authority. You're, you are crucifying your life, your purpose, your will, your intent, your way of doing everything to submit fully and entirely to him. And in order to do that, you're going to have to repent. You have to change your thinking. And then you believe in his finished work. In his finished work. I don't have to die in order to only get it by myself. I have to die to myself, but I have to die to myself and receive the blood that he shed for me. He made the payment. I could not get there on my own initiative. Are you hearing me? So repent is a big deal. I said it's a big deal. It's not the gospel without repentance. It's not the new birth without repentance. I'm going to say that again. It's not the new birth without repentance. And you say, well, wait a minute now. I mean, they don't know anything about God who's lost and separated from. They have to repent. They have to change their thinking that they can be right with God without God without the finished work of Jesus. So someone who calls on the name of the Lord or believes that he died on the cross and rose from the grave, they already changed their thinking that they can get there without that. So they actually did a natural thing first. And when I say natural, I'm saying they decided to take that thought. Now, I understand the thought comes by revealing by the Spirit. So again, no man goes after God, no, not one. But once the Holy Spirit reveals to man's mind, yeah. Jesus is the only way. Yeah. And you know that you know in your mind now. I can't do it my way. Then you change your thinking and you then with your heart, with everything that you have, with, I mean, honestly, your spirit man's dead at the moment you know, you're confessing Jesus is Lord. But that event, 
through the revealing of the Spirit that you can call on the name of the Lord to be saved, it will cause the spirit of the man that's dead to be evicted from this skin suit and you'll get a new creature in Christ. Are you hearing me? So repentance is key. Unfortunately, we think repentance is only a one-time shot. Yet, we'll see that that's not true. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, it says this. These are the disciples now going around fulfilling the Great Commission. And it says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men that all people everywhere should Repent. Repent's a big deal. God, the God's Word translation says it this way. God overlooked the times when people didn't know any better, but now he commands everyone everywhere to turn to him and change the way they think and act. And act. Acts 26, 20. Acts 26, 20. But declaring, but, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should what? Repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Performing what? Deeds. deeds. Another word for deeds is works. Yep, the old dirty word in the church, which is not a dirty word because doctrines of demons have attacked the church with the word work when the reality is just keep reading Ephesians 2.10 where everyone says it's not a work any, less any man should, it's not a man's work independent of God. That's what it means. But we are born again for the purpose of having good Works, which means a lifestyle that now is in keeping with repentance. The God's Word translation says it this way of Acts 26 20. Both groups were expected to change the way they thought and acted and turned to God. I told them to do things that prove they have changed their lives. We have reduced being born again to a God-only event, and there is no man side. And that once we're born again, we still do nothing, which is not a true statement, because the Bible doesn't support it. And the early church knew this very well, of which Jesus himself understood this. I said Jesus himself understood this. Jesus never expected for us to be born again and never change the way we think so that our thinking would be in line with this new spirit that we are. Are you hearing me? So again, the problem is, is that you and I have already been instructed by the Holy Ghost, so this is in our advantage. And, and you need to understand it's to your advantage because there's many places that are only dealing with the spirit side. What I mean by that is that what Jesus could only do and then put in you at your confession, which is a new creature in Christ, your spirit is perfect, but you're not just a spirit. And so anytime you take the Bible and only deal and try to take the spiritual thing that has taken place in us and apply it to our soul realm, you're going to get off and apply it to your body realm, you're going to get off. No one would believe that your body now is eternal. None of us believe that. Nobody believes that you're going to live forever. Yet in the spirit you do. Right? In our spirit, we're like, our spirit's alive. We'll always be with the Lord. Yeah, but your body's not. You're going to get a glorified body. And that is an accepted truth across the board. But what's not accepted is what's going on in the soul. Because many are attaching the spirit and saying the spirit and the soul are one. And they're not one. I said they're not one. The Bible clearly communicates there is a difference between your soul and a spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, you're not going to hear these things. You're not going to have that conversation. So again, they go back into the Old Testament and say, well, it's the heart. It's the heart. That's talking about the spirit of the man. The spirit of the man was dead in the Old Covenant, yeah. which means it only listened to the soul. Yeah. 
And it did everything from a soul perspective. Because that's all it could. When Adam ate the fruit, he was limited to his five senses. And he tried to worship God the best he could with all of his soul. It was only those that had experienced the spirit upon that began to access some things concerning the spirit, even though their spirit man was dead. Are you hearing me? So there was a plausibility. It was possible for man to be righteous even though his spirit was dead in that dispensation. But in the new one, in the new one, it lets us know there's a difference because once we got born again, it did not change our mind. Didn't change our mind. Just like it did not make us put on a glorified body immediately. That is a future event. When it comes to our soul realm, we have the responsibility. I love what Pastor John George said very clearly. I'm going to apply it to us all. He said, you know, parents, it's God's responsibility to save your child's spirit. It's your responsibility to help save their soul. Well, that applies individually. To us, God saved our spirit. He's responsible for saving our spirit. It's our responsibility to save our soul. And the Bible talks about the saving of the soul. So the minute we're born again, that doesn't mean our mind's right. And, and nowhere does it mean that God allows your mind to continue to be wrong and he's okay with it. In essence, really what the gospel tells us is that if you'll change your thinking, you'll be able to access the kingdom constantly. So I'm going to put in you a, your spirit is going to be right with God and right standing with the king. Then I'll put him in there as well, meaning the Holy Ghost, who's going to teach you kingdom stuff so that now your mind can think and respond like the, a king of the kingdom. And you have that responsibility to hear from the great teacher that lives on the inside. And that he will enlighten you. He would illuminate. He would reveal to you God's will that now you actually have the power to say, soul, you're going to change the way you think about this. You're fixing to change the way you feel about this right now. You don't control me anymore. You know, up to this point, the soul realm controlled man. Man was led by his sight. That is a sense in the soul realm. But now we're not led by our sight. We're led by faith or the word of God. We have something happening on the inside that we're led by that we come back up to our soul realm and we say, this is how we're going to respond now. Are you hearing me? So we know in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, I'm just going to quote him for you. He said that, that man would be blameless until the return of Jesus in his spirit, soul, and body. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, you can write that down so you can study this for yourself or remind yourself that we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. Then in uh, Hebrews um, chapter 4, verse 12, it says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce between joint and marrow, soul and spirit. So the only thing that can, can let you know what is a feeling and what is spirit is the word of God. Which tells us that there are plenty of born-again believers, but if they're not in the word, they can still be led by their soul and not the spirit. Because you have to learn of the spirit in order to be led by the spirit. And the spirit don't care how you feel. Now, when I say that, that's not that he's insensitive or that he doesn't care. I'm just saying if he gives you a direction, even though in the natural, it may cause many people to be fearful it may cause many people to want to cry. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what the situation is. I'm just throwing out some examples. Uh, in essence, he's like, you just need to follow this and don't go based upon the way you feel. Because my word works. And you can change, say, well, I'm, I'm not going to feel that way. I'm going to feel the way the Spirit's telling me to feel. And a lot of times, he'll have you feel joy. Another thing he'll do is have you feel peace. Are you hearing me? And so you'll, you'll sense peace in your spirit and you'll put it over your soul realm and say, well, I'm going to walk in this peace instead of being fearful. 
So did Jesus know this word repent meant something? Well, again, we opened up in Mark 1 that it says after John was put into prison, Jesus came preaching. Well, what did John preach? John the Baptist. Well, it's in Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, John the Baptist preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what is that? It's the gospel. Thank you. <laughs> One person's got it. We've, we left the scripture and we've already forgotten what the gospel is. <sighs> Let's change our thinking. The gospel is not Jesus Christ out on the cross and rose from the dead. That is the way into the gospel. It's the way into the gospel. You know, because honestly, it's not good news that Jesus died. You know, we call it Good Friday, but by all rights, it wasn't a good day. It wasn't a good day. I mean, it was a, it was a sorrowful day. It was sorrowful for the Father. I mean, it was... It was Painful for Jesus, but Jesus had a different uh, mindset because the Bible tells us in Hebrews, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So when he looked at the cross, he saw it as a joyful experience, although his body was in extreme pain. Are you hearing me? So by all rights, it's not good to die. But he had to die so that we could get into the good place. Because if Adam had never eaten the fruit, we wouldn't have this problem, right? And if we hadn't sinned ourselves, we wouldn't have this problem. But we did, and so Jesus pays the price so that we can come in. So repent, which means change your thinking is what John preached. And did John know what he was saying when he said repent? Yes, jump down to verse 8. And if you don't think Jesus was around hearing this or knowing this, then you would be mistaken because you understand John is only related to Jesus. And where do you think John got his message from? Jesus called John the greatest prophet. He said he was the greatest. No miracles are happening. He's the greatest preacher, God, uh, prophet. Why? Well, he's announcing the king. Right. He's announcing this is the fulfillment of uh, uh, the fulfillment of time. This is where the good news is finally made available for people to access back in the planet, that you don't have to wait to go to heaven. This is what God was always wanting. He's wanting to get it back, and he's getting it back to us still, not in er as it originally was, because our soul and our body is going to be perfect as well, but he's definitely getting where he's among men. Because Jesus means Emmanuel, God with us, not man's coming to God. God wanted to come to us. He wanted to be in us. And he doesn't want to wait for you to go to heaven to have a relationship. He wants to come and have his abode with you now. And he's not concerned that you're in a sinful world still because once you get right with him, that stuff don't have anything to do with you. He's delivered you from that. He's, he's taken you out of the law of sin and death. He's re redeemed you. He's put a spirit in you that, has, that doesn't want to sin or be rebellious to the Father ever again. And then he puts the Holy Ghost in you that says, now let's get your mind right so that you can act and have the kingdom functioning in your life all the time because it's really not about when you go to heaven. Heaven came to you. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Man, that's good news. Yes. Such good news. And so he knew that if we repented, then there's going to be a evidence that's going to follow. And he says, John says this, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, he was obviously talking to some religious people that knew the word, that had access to the word, and yet they were manipulating the word so they could live their way of living instead. This is how we're going to use God's word so that this can be our lifestyle. We're going to manipulate God's word to justify our lifestyle and say we're right with God. I'm telling you, this is worse than an unbeliever not even knowing scripture trying to live right for God. It's not working, but, you know, they don't even have the excuse of knowing the word. These guys here, they knew the word. They had access to it. 
And, and they were in the environment where the Spirit of God would come upon the priest in order to rightly divide it and see it with clarity. And yet they were rejecting that so that they could maintain fruit that was not from the kingdom. But John calls them out on this. He calls them out. He said, now, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with a change of thinking. Are you hearing me? So the passion of this verse, Matthew 3, 8, says it this way. You must prove your repentance by a changed life. <laughs> Amen. Now, just for the sake of record, I'm not saying that the minute you get born again, you're going to do everything right. Obviously, you're not. You're going to be a babe in Christ, and you're going to make mistakes. But, you know, even a baby will keep coming to milk. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's what babies do. They come to milk. They keep coming to milk. They're not going to reject milk. Now, if you get born again and then you never come to milk, well, then you're probably not born again, which means you had a confession with your mouth, but your heart was far from it because you can't tell me you're right with God if I'm begging you to get to milk. Right? Right? I mean, honestly, I love what Pastor Daryl Huffman says. He says, I got born again for life. Yeah. This wasn't like until the first problem came, right. until the first issue took place. Yeah. And I wasn't trying him. Right. And you know what? He's, no one's begging him. Right. No one begged him. I mean, many of you, you're not, no one's begging you. You're just like, this is what I do because I'm alive to God. Yeah. And that is what babes do. Right. Babes know. Somebody that is with me now who has begotten me has got some milk somewhere and get me to the milk. Hallelujah. <laughs> the com uh, contemporary English version says this, do something to show that you have really given up your sins. Do something. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The God, God's word says it this way, to uh, do those things that prove you have turned to God and have changed the way you think and act. Again, a righteous man may fall, but he gets up. I said he gets up. At the end of the day, may fall seven, but he gets up. Nowhere am I preaching perfection. What I'm preaching is maturity. Develop maturity. Yes. You know what's, what's amazing to me is that people will make all kind of excuses not to be with God and act like they're still with God. It's just amazing. Why? Because have they really repented? You know, again, when we sell Jesus as you couldn't do anything, and just ask him to come into your heart and save you. Then when you die, you know you're going to go to heaven because it doesn't really matter what you do after that. God loves you anyway. In essence, we're endorsing something other than what Jesus called the gospel. You know, if someone ever said, well, I just want to come to church, you know, because I want to come. You know, I don't want to have to be made. You know, because, you know, one thing that we do here at Anchor Faith Church, if you're going to partner with the vision, again, we had 40 people lined up for supportive ministry, uh, and they're going to be they're assigned now somewhere. Uh, part of the responsibility of serving is that you actually have to attend church. You don't serve and then don't come to church. Right? So again, well, you know, I, I want to come just because I want to come. I don't want to come because I have to serve. Well, first of all, you obviously don't know Jesus because Jesus would ask you to serve. So serving should come out of your heart. So if you already feel like you're being made, then I'm asking the question, are you right with God? Because if we only can show up when we're scheduled, then you've made it work, not me. I mean, I say we're a job. Let's put it that way. You made it a job. You know, everybody goes to a, to a job when they're scheduled. And you know how many people go to a job and they don't want to go? And then they'll say, well, you know, I want to go to church when I want to because I don't feel like I have to. Well, you have to go to job and you go to job. 
And the job didn't die for you. The job didn't, the money you're making from the job will not save your life from eternal damnation. It will not heal your body. I don't care how good your insurance is. The insurance you have does not cover every condition. Even if you're going through cancer, it can't heal cancer. It can just pay for the treatments. And your retirement. I mean, I'm gr glad you got this great 401k, but at the end of the day, what's going to happen? Yeah, you know, I mean, many people go to jobs they don't want to go to. <laughs> well, yeah, you should come to church because you want to, which is pretty simple. I mean, it's an easy overflow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> that's why, you know, the hired employees that we have here, I mean, that's like no-brainer. I mean, you're hired because you're a vision partner and you come to church. And if you don't want to come to church but you do want to come to work, there's a problem. I mean, that's like just a natural overflow. It's not a forcing. It's an overflow of a heart to serve a vision. And then God pays you as well to do a part of it. I mean, how exciting is that? Right? Yeah, it's like, wow, this is amazing. Amen. Well, I feel like I have to go. That's, that's your problem. It's not, I, it's, not, it's not my problem. I love to do what God wants to do. I love to be in his presence. I love to serve his church. I love to serve him. Because I have a lifestyle in keeping with repentance. Did I do God's word already? Okay, let's do Amplified. Amplified Matthew 3, 8 says it this way. So produce fruit that is consistent with repentance, demonstrating new behavior that proves a change of heart and a conscious decision to turn away from sin. Why would Jesus call us into his kingdom and then keep us in a position where we have, we lack power of community? I mean, there's nowhere in scripture that individuality or let's put it independence is what God was looking for. Let me just say it this way. There's actually no in scripture that literally constitutes a singular thinking of personal savior. God never intended to have one son. God was never going to have one. Never. And it's from our first pages. Let us make Man in our image, according to our likeness, I'm going to pull out of that man a woman, and then they're going to multiply. They're going to produce God's seeds, kingly seeds. The whole race. When Adam falls from dominion, the Lord's like, the seed of man's corrupt now. So I got to get a different seed in the woman because I'm looking for a community. I'm not looking for one person here. So when he gets into covenant with Abram, what's he say? He says, Abram, I'm going to make a covenant with you, and I'm going to call you Abraham, which is known as the father of, of what? Many nations. Not, I just want through you to get Jesus so I could personally be with people individually. I don't want them to know each other and interact with one another. I don't even want them to get along. I want them for me and me alone. So what I'm gonna do in eternity, I'm gonna line them up. And I'm just gonna have one dance before me and sings praises to me, you know, tell me how awesome I am. And when I'm tired of hearing their voice, I'll send them out and I'll bring the other one. They won't know each other because eternity's big. You understand, that I'm letting you know with the universe it's really large and I can put y'all in different places that you never have to be around anyone. That's not the case. 
The only reason why people don't want to connect is because they don't want to change their thinking. Hallelujah. No, repentance means, all right, I'll just follow God completely, however he wants and what that looks like. Amen. And I realize the brother to my left and the sister to my right, they're working things out. They're growing. They're having to change their thinking constantly so that their behavior will be reflective of not a person who sins. And I realize sometimes they're not going to make it. But I'm going to be there to encourage them, strengthen them, tell them, let's go, get on up. I'm not going to say, you know what? I couldn't do it either. Let's go back and live like we used to. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the world's really wanting you to demonstrate it. When I say that, you just live it. And they're like, why do you go to church all the time? Why are you reading the Bible all the time? Why are you praying? Now, when I say all the time, it's not literally all the time, but you understand so much so that they notice. Are you hearing me? That they associate you with that. You know, I, I never hear you cuss. I, you never talk about anybody at work. Are you hearing me? Amen. That this behavior becomes so different. Because they're like, yeah, well, you know, my relationship with Jesus. Well, I know plenty of people who ever said they have a relationship with Jesus, but they live like I do. Well, I don't believe that's what God intended. Because again, as we said in prayer, God never intended us to be relevant to the world. He expected us to be different. Because they're in darkness, and when we're different, we'll actually be in light, and they'll be drawn to the light, not to our sameness. God changed me. Repent means to change one's mind. It means to change one's mind for the better. I mean, when your spirit, man, wasn't better before God, correct? So why, when we get born again, we think our mind's better just because he's in us now? It's not better because we can still think the same way. And you've seen many people that are born again, get mad, cuss, you know, uh, backbite, lie, even steal, fornicate. Steal, fornicate. It's mind-blowing. Well, you know, I just believe the Lord wants me to be around them because he's going to use me to get them right. So you sleep with them on the weekend and then bring them to church. I don't understand this. <laughs> you don't understand. We're online, so I got to talk about outside this house. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how many people will justify when the Holy Ghost will have conversation. And it's like, hey, let's change our thinking about how this relationship goes. Because guess what? The Holy Spirit, who happens to know the beginning from the end, could literally say, man, I'm sure glad you're in the kingdom now, but you're going to have to let this one go. What? Yeah, you're going to need to let them go. This is not the relationship for you. But I've been with them for five years. I love... Yeah, you lusted after them. It's really what was going on. You were led by your emotions here. But now you're alive. I know this is hard to your emotions, but put on my peace. It's going to be all right. I got somebody better. And how many people married a wrong person? Because they won't renew their mind and let God bring the right person. Joseph Benson, who's a commentary for Scripture, says this, for repentance not only implies sorrow for sin or sincerely wishing it undone, but a change of mind and a reforma uh, reform reformation of life. So again, repent never meant to not actually change the way you live now. It did not mean I feel sorry for my sin Come into my heart and save me. I can't do anything better. And I'm never going to be great. I'm never do it. I'm never going to be perfect. The Bible never asks you to be perfect. It asks you to be mature. And you can be mature. And a mature person will not willfully sin or make excuses for sinning, nor make excuses to stay offended. Won't do that. 
Aren't you glad that you don't do that? Aren't you glad that you don't do that? Well, I was hoping to be a little bit louder. Aren't you glad you don't do that? Okay, say it in faith then. <laughs> God has empowered us with the greater one, and I don't have to do that. I get to resist sin. I get to put it down. I get to take every thought captive. I actually have control of what I'm thinking about. This is awesome. Hallelujah. So Romans 12, 2 says it this way, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. The Bible in basic English says it this way. And let not your behavior be like that of this world, but be changed and made new in mind so that by experience you may have knowledge of the good and pleasing and complete purpose of God. Now notice Romans is directly saying if your mind's being renewed, it's your responsibility. Now, it's not without God's help. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you're getting this on your own. I'm saying as you're reading and studying the word, because again, Jesus said, go and make disciples. So again, when we're selling the good news, when we are preaching the good news, when we're communicating the good news, when we're trying to convince people about the good news, and the good news is... The kingdom. Okay? What we're saying to them is that, hey, there's a whole nother way to live. Whole nother way to live. And you can't get in it by yourself. You're going to have to believe on the finished work of Jesus. But once you're in, then he's going to deposit in you a spirit that wants to obey dad and put his own spirit in you so that you can be taught and then he's going to reveal scripture to you to help clean your mind up. So you'll quit thinking like you're thinking. This is really awesome. We have a personal tutor. <laughs> Amen. Now, a tutor comes alongside things that are already teaching us. So the Holy Ghost does two things. Number one, he is the great teacher. Don't get me wrong. But what I mean by that is he does allow, because God wanted it this way, the fivefold ministry to equip the saints. And through the fivefold ministry, who are actually being led by the Spirit and not popularity, and preaching what God wants to be preached, okay, then when you're hearing that truth, then your Spirit will say, now that's what I'm talking about. And you're receiving it not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God. You just happen to hear it through the voice of the gift. That's all. You understand what I'm saying? And there are many things the Holy Spirit wants to teach you through the gift. Why? Because he never wanted you to have a personal assignment with him alone. Because when the scripture says in Hebrews, you don't need man to teach you anymore, that ha that's in reference to how the old covenant was, is that you could only learn through those that had the anointing on. But now you have an anointing, and that anointing now will actually let, you're not only subject to what they say because they say it, you act I will actually verify that what they're saying is true. So truth is being spoken. And you know what's funny about those individuals that actually grab that scripture and um, kind of complain about that position, you know? Um, or, you know, they're like, I don't need anyone to teach me. But they always want somebody to listen to them. <laughs> they're the ones that are on social media trying to teach everybody. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, you said it. Why are you even talking? Since you've learned this truth that you don't need anybody to teach you, you should just be quiet. You should cease to be heard. Why are you violating your own belief by trying to teach somebody that? Why are you trying to teach somebody that? The Holy Ghost to teach them that. So he doesn't need you. <laughs> Since we're thinking. Amen. I'm just so thankful for the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You know, because he he, he's good. He won't let you get duped up. Yeah. He won't let you get, you know, drug along. I mean, at the end of the day, he will help you out along the way. Amen? 
Thank you, Jesus. All right, so uh, Romans 12, 2, in the complete uh, contemporary English version, it says, don't be like the people of this world, but let God change the way you think. Then you will know how to do everything that is good and pleasing to him. The Good News Bible says, this, says it this way, do not conform yourself to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and pleasing to him and is perfect. Now, every one of these scriptures so far, they are saying, if you don't let God renew your mind, it's impossible for you to be in his will. Now, you can be born again and be completely out of the will of God. So being born again is access to the will of God. It is God's will that all would repent. That all would what? Mm, where's that at? Find, somebody look that scripture up real quick for me and tell me where it's at. Uh, well, I don't all y'all shouting at me, but... Um, you know what it is? The one where Jesus, the Lord says, you know, the Father desires that none would perish, but that all would repent. Second what? Okay. Yeah, I still didn't hear it. Hold on. Um, second what? Peter. Second Peter, let me get there. Uh, where you at? Okay. Three? Niner. It's military. Uh, the Lord is slow is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to salvation. No, doesn't say that, does it? Isn't that interesting? So this scripture is not a scripture only about being born again. We use this all the time just as a born-again scripture. Well, God desires that none would perish. Right? But look what he says. The Lord is not slow about his what? Now, who in the world has access to the promises of God? Only the covenant kids. As some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Oh, my goodness. Are you hearing what I'm saying right now? So again, we believe in God. He's not slow on his promises, but he's patient towards us, not wishing to any what? That none of us would perish. My people perish due to lack of knowledge. Their covenant people that are perishing are not receiving what God has for them, and it's because they don't change their thinking in order to receive it. They're living like the world who doesn't have access to it. So God doesn't want any of us to perish or not have the promises through to the lack of not renewing our minds. Now, anyone could access, can I move this over to a lost person? Sure, because in order to get born again, you have to first repent and believe the gospel or that Jesus is king of the kingdom. He is Lord. He is ruler. And his death, burial, and resurrection was the payment for you to get in. But then once you're in, then he's always wanting to renew your mind. Change your thinking, change your thinking, change your thinking, change your thinking, change your, about every situation that's going on in life. He wants to change your thinking. And some of the worst thinking to change is the religious, and I get it. I mean, it's all in there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But if you're willing to actually take time to go through, you'll find yourself adjusting. And you won't allow the accepted majority to be your response, even if it comes from whole denominations. Amen? Hallelujah. The message says, don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. What? Let me just say this. You may walk into place and you look the same as a human. But when they get around you, it shouldn't be long 
for them to realize you are not the same. And let me just say this. If you're doing it right, then you know what? Even the lost will talk to you. Now, some won't because if, if they get convicted by your presence and your living and you're talking, well, then they will isolate themselves from you. And there's nothing you can do about it because they're doing that to Jesus. Are you hearing me? But on the other side, there are others that their lifestyle's completely off, and they will still talk to you. There's not a person, nowhere I go, that I cannot engage in conversation. Period. If they personally ask me my belief, I will personally tell them. And that doesn't hinder my ability to talk to them. Now, it may hinder their ability to talk to me, but it won't hinder me. Because your sin, especially the world, the world's going to sin. Nobody that's in sin. I mean, I, you're sinning. I, I can't stop it. So there's really no reason for me to harp on you about changing. I just might as well live this life so that you will want this life. And then I'll say, you know, you'll have to change your life. Now, it's easy. God will help you. First spiritually, and then boom, we'll get it through the renewal of mind after that. Pretty simple. So the things that I preach in church are a lot different than when I'm in front of the world. Right? So if you're sitting here assuming that if I go to a restaurant and that I'm telling people about their sin and calling it out, I'm not doing that. None of us should do that. I mean, I actually have waiters and waitresses that are in uh, fornication relationships, adulterous relationships, homosexual relationships, and I tip them really great because I'm not um, uh, uh, appealing to their sin. I'm showing them the goodness of God. They can't help it. I mean, when Christians are like, oh, I can't believe you're doing, you know, I, I'm not going to. That's so silly. God died for that. Yeah. Now, if you tell me you're a brother and you're sleeping with somebody, I'll still tip you good and tell you you need to get out of relationship because you know better. It's a different conversation. But what do people do? They want to take the everyone's loss mentality and apply it all the way across the board to where we don't even hold our own uh, brethren accountable. When Jesus says, I'll judge the house first, he says, you can judge your brother. You're definitely going to look at their fruit. You're definitely going to have to live up to a standard because if you've repented, then there's a lifestyle that I make a demand to happen. And the reason why John said, why don't you have a lifestyle in keeping with repentance since you're acting like you know God? That's what he's saying. He sure didn't say it to everyone else. John never told another person, why don't you have a lifestyle in keeping with repentance? You know why? Because when those people got right, they lived right. Wow. They lived right. Who did Jesus have conflict with? He sure wasn't walking around telling, you know, everyone that was all out in sin. I mean, now he talked about it. The kingdom of God is like, he's letting them know. I mean, he's having conversations, but he's not in the dispensation of his church. But don't think the head of the church isn't conversing. I mean, the woman at the well is a great example. Don't think he let that go, nor did he let the woman go caught in adultery. He didn't let that go. And, and, and many, we don't even know their sin. But once he healed them, he said, go in, sin no more. We just don't know the details of what they were doing. But he sure was an advocate for it. But now the people who say they knew him, that conversation sounded different. So you, I can't sit here. And, you, and again, let me just say it this way. If you're bringing a guest that you know is not born again, you need to let them know. Man, our pastor now, he talks to us as believers so that we stay right. You know, because God wants us to live this life right. So you're going to hear some things that, that, you know, unless you're born again, you just can't even do that. At least be wise enough to inform them. Because at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not supposed to be the greatest 
evangelist. You are. Your life should be getting them born again at work, which means then once they come in and they'll want the milk, they'll be like, like many of you have done, wow, this is so good. It's life-changing. I've never heard anything like that. Because your spirit man is hungry for it. The Holy Spirit saying it's truth, and you start renewing your mind. I just told someone during prayer that was like, I was in a place, a pastor was preaching. They said, now repeat this. And when they repeated, me and the other person looked at each other like, we can't say that because it's not biblical. How do they know that? Because the Holy Ghost says, you can't say that. That's not even scriptural. I don't care if the preacher's saying it. And can I just say this? I have preached for almost, I have preached almost three decades. I have preached a lot of messages. I would love to tell you that I never fail to say a word right when I preach. Sometimes I do. Sometimes the word comes out and it wasn't the right word and I don't catch it till later. I mean, if you know the person's character and you're believing the best, then you're not looking for one word to fail. Basic, you know who was looking for one word of a failure? The Pharisees. All the Pharisees waiting to hear, let me just get him to say one thing so I can discredit everything he does. And we kill him, kill him, we all kill him. So don't be coming up in here looking for one word so that you can try to justify. So funny. Just walk in love, man. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let me go back to the message because we have communion today. Because communion reminds me that I'm different. He changed me. And I just, I just want us to be a community of believers that actually live heaven on earth. Is that, is that wrong? Is that such a lofty goal? that you would just desire that everyone who says that Jesus is Lord is that we would actually really love one another as the word says, not as we say. That we really forgive each other as the word says, not as we say. I mean, is it too much to ask? It's not. It's only too much to ask if you don't want to change your behavior but go to heaven. And it's too much to ask, and I get it. And this is not your church. This is not your church, because that's not his church. But it's definitely for those who want what's on the inside to come out in the way they think and behave and talk, because it's your king. He knew you couldn't get to him anyway. And despite all that, he still died for you. And then he says, now, let me help clean up your mind because it was really a mess in there. And we're like, don't touch my mind. Just remember me when I die because I like what I was doing. No, mess is don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out readily recognize that he wants what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Wow. How powerful is that? The Passion says it this way, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. But be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. The last scripture I'm going to turn you to is in Ephesians chapter 4. Again, we need to think again. God caused us to become children of God or children of the king so that we could think again like kings. Because God gave us our dominion back. 
He never gave us a salvation that we're holding on and just stuck living like everybody else and subject to all the passions and temptations and, and handling the situations just like everybody else, you know, and at the end, if we just hold on good enough, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to go and it's going to be way better there. That was never God's intent. His intent was to get you born again so that you could become, have dominion, so you could function as a king, so that he could bring heaven to you in and, and through in you and through you, and then change your whole system of thinking of how to operate, how to handle everything in life, so that then the world would be drawn to you because they would truly clearly see you're not of this world. Wow, we're not of this world, we're not subject to it anymore. But it takes our effort to change. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24 is this, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of, de of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. The Passion says it this way, and he has taught you to let go of the lifestyle of the ancient man, the old self-life, which was corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires that spring from delusions. Now it's time to be made new by every revelation that's been given to you and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as, you, as your new life and live in union with him. For God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness and now, and you now belong to him in the realm of true holiness. Well, that should be lived out in our lifestyle. And here's the thing, there's no excuse for it to not since our spirit, man, is that right with God? Is that alive to God? Is, is not wanting to sin ever. Ever. It never chooses, our spirit never chooses sin. Our spirit never chooses sin. It's never its choice. It's never its choice to respond in the flesh. It's never its choice. And as you train your mind, your soul, to hear in your spirit, in your inner man, then you can always side with the spirit of God in every situation and produce that fruit every time. Isn't that amazing? The message says it this way, but that's no lie for you. You learned Christ. My assumption is that you paid careful attention to him, been well instructed in the truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we do not have, do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean Everything connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And even take on an entirely new way of life. A God-fashioned life. A life renewed from the inside, working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. Say, I have the character of God. Say, I have the character of God. Say, I have the character of God. Because the spirit in you is going to change your thinking if you allow it.